Good morning, everybody. Um, I was hoping that you guys would be typing away on the questions you had for Chapter 3 and Section 4.1. We will start with Section 4.1 questions because that was the last thing that we did last Wednesday. So we're going to uh, go over questions on that. I'm also going to pull up the learning catalytics quiz that was due today, and we're going to go over that. And we'll talk about the test today that's coming up. And then after the break, we're going to work on the learning catalytics quiz together. So if you haven't already started it, you can do that after the break, and we'll kind of work through that review together. Okay, so right now, you should be looking for questions you have from section 4.1. So we can go over that. And I'm pulling it up too. So 4.1, if you remember, was about probability distributions and in particular discrete probability distributions. So it was looking for the probability of something occurring uh, from a discrete random variable, things that you count. Remember, discrete variables are uh, things or, that you can count, like how many dogs do you have or how many brothers and sisters do you have, that type of thing. Um, whereas continuous variables are things that are measured and can have in-between values. And we're going to be going on to continuous variables after test two. So but te in test two, it's all about probability, which is chapter three. All the things that we've learned about probability and counting techniques and the different kinds of probability. And then the other thing on the test is section 4.1, which is probability distributions. And specifically discrete probability distributions. In unit three, we'll be going on to some continuous probability distributions. It's a probability distributions are a really big thing in uh, statistics. Okay, so did anybody find any questions from 4.1 that you'd like for me to go over? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Temperance. Uh, did anybody do section 4.1? Maybe I should check that. I'll check and see. Hopefully so. Yeah, a few people did. One, two, three, four, five, about six people did it. And, uh, okay, good job, Christina. Cecil says, can we go over number 17? Okay, so let's do that. Okay, now 17 is going to ask you to do the mean, variance, and standard deviation of a probability distribution. And that's probably going to be the most time-consuming thing on the test. 
there will be one question where you have to compute the mean of a probability distribution. So on, on mine, uh, Cecil, is okay if I use mine for an example? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I will do one more like this, okay, so that you will have it in your notes. Everybody, if you can, open up my math lab. If you have a device on which you can uh, do have uh, collaborate, have the session open, go ahead and open my math lab on a separate tab or my stat lab on a separate tab if you can and sign in and open up the 4.1 homework. Some of you haven't started it yet. So open up that 4.1 homework and get to problem 17. And I'm going to give you a minute to do that. So you can do that while I am copying my problem down because it gives me a probability distribution here. This is a probability distribution about the number of defects per 1,000 machine parts inspected. So, um, and they're giving me the probability. In other words, if you inspect a thousand machine parts, what's the probability that, and they do this sideways like this. They're giving you the probability that none of the thousand will be defective, and then one, and this goes all the way up to five. So that is a thing you can count. That's a discrete random variable. You can count how many were defective out of the thousand, and then you can compute a probability from that. So if you take a, a, a thousand of them, the, they computed that the probability that none of them will be defective, and they have that. So I'm just going to write mine down, and your numbers are probably different. And so we see that the most likely thing is, if you inspect a thousand of these machine parts, it looks like the most likely thing is that one in a th of the thousand will be um, defective. But the probability that, say, less than three out of a thousand would be defective, we could add those to find the answer to that question. Uh, the probability that none of the thousand would be defective would be this 0.265, which is about 26.5%. Uh, the probability that uh, five will be defective, so it's saying um, that the number of defects. So apparently uh, there weren't ever more than five defective out of the thousand, which should be good. And the first question is to find the mean. And remember, the mean has two labels when you're talking about discrete probability or discrete random variables. Uh, they call the mean, sometimes they call it the expected value of x or e of x, the expected value, how many you expect on average to be defective, but also it's a mean, so they call it mu. This is a formula on your formula sheet. Make sure that you have your formula sheet, that you've either written the formulas down on a piece of paper to use on the test, or that you've printed off the one that I made available in the Unit 2 folder in Blackboard. So if you look at this, the formula you will see for the mean of a discrete random variable is it tells you take the sum of the x's times the p of x's. So if I wanted to do that for this problem, that means for each one, basically I'm multiplying this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this. So you could make another column if you wanted to. You could do x times p of x right here, you know, and just multiply for each one. And then my mean would be to add those numbers. So I think I'll do that. 
I'm going to take each one of the X's and multiply it. So zero times this is going to be zero for this column. For this column, one times this will just be 0.291. For this column, two times this will be 0.484. Um, three times 0.155 is 0.465. 4 times 0 0.036 is 0 0.144. So what I'm doing, guys, is I'm multiplying down. And then 5 times 0 0.011 is 0 0.055. If I ask you to show a work on one like this, you could just show what I'm about to show you here. So my mean is going to be the sum of those products. So I'm just going to take these results. And add them together. So you could have this as your work right here. And you could draw the mule, the, the mule, you could draw the mule with your draw tool, or you could just type the word mean. That would be okay too. And so on this one, when I add these together, I'm gonna add them in my calculator. That number's already in my calculator, so I'm gonna add backwards. 0.144 plus 0.465 plus 0.484, plus 0.291, and zero. Now remember, we already talked about the most likely thing was that out of the 1,000, that either zero or um, that definitely less than three would probably be defective. And notice what we found the average is, is 1.439. That's what I got without rounding. And then they want us to round this to one decimal place, so I would round that to 1.4. And I believe when you do the variance, I believe when you do the variance that it will be okay to use the rounded number to find the variance. Um, I believe my math, my stat lab, that you'll get the right answer for the variance if you use this rounded mean. In real life, though, you would try to use the unrounded mean because it's not your final answer. That would be in real life. But I'm pretty sure, in my example, I'm going to use the rounded one because I think that's what they intend for you to do. So I'm going to put this in and make sure that I did the mean right. You have to be really careful on the mean because if you miss that, you're going to miss all of them. So I got 1.4. Okay, so that was the correct answer on this one. Now the next one is to find the variance. Does anybody have a question about finding the mean of a discrete random variable before I go on? I'm hoping you can see that if you draw the chart on your scratch paper, then you just multiply down, and that gives you the different numbers that you need to add to get the mean. You see, those are the numbers I added to get the mean. Any questions? Okay, then let's go on to the variance. which is sigma squared. And again, using your formula sheet. Where did I put my formula sheet? Here it is. And you'll see that for this, the formula they give you is the sum of the x's minus the means squared times the probability.
I'm going to do this a little bit different way because I think maybe it will make it easier for you. So I'm going to take my X's up there. I'm going to write this down this way, okay? So my X's were 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. What I'm going to do for each of those X's is I am going to find this part right here, the x minus mu squared. Now remember, I already know what mu is. I'm going to use 1.4. So my mu is 1.4. So I'm going to do x minus 1.4 squared. And I'm going to do that in this column. So for this first one, for example, 0 minus 1.4 squared. 1 minus 1.4 squared. I know this is kind of a, a lot of calculations, but it's not hard calculations. It's just a lot of calculations. So try to keep that in mind and just be careful of what you're doing. So what I'm doing is I'm computing x minus mu squared for each value of x. So if you're doing yours, I'm going to give you a minute to get to this point. If you like the way this is arranged, then that's great. Then you can do it this way when you do this problem on the test. You're not going to have to do more than one of these problems. So don't worry that you're taking a test of 20 problems like this because you aren't. You might have one problem like this, but if you can do this one, you should be able to do everything else and make a really good grade on this test. So don't blow it off just because it's a little bit harder than the others. So because it's still doable, it just takes a little bit of time and determination. So in the first one, 0 minus 1.4 squared. And let me remind you, so I'm going to hold my calculator up. When I do 0 minus 1.4 quantity squared, notice I put that in parentheses. That's important. If you don't have that x squared button, remember another option is to use the up arrow, the caret button, and raise it to the second power, which is the same thing. And then when I hit equals, I get 1.96. Then, if you have a calculator like this, or most calculators, I can then, I don't have to retype every time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to up arrow, I'm going to change that 0 to a 1, and hit enter, and I get the next one. Let me do that again. I'm going to arrow up and change that 1 to a 2, and hit enter. So once you get one of them, I'm going to change the 2 to a 3. Change the 3 to a 4. And change the 4 to a 5. So I'm going to give you a minute to do that part. What I just did was I computed this part of the product for every value of x. And once this first one typed in, I can arrow and edit and change it to a 1, then a 2, then a 3, then a 4, then a 5, and get these numbers very quickly. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm going to give you a minute to kind of catch up and look at the chart and see how you can get to this point.
while you're catching up on that, I'll, I'll be right back. I'm going to let you catch up on that. If you're in my stat lab, I want you to go to problem 17. I want you to try to get this far. I'll be right back. Okay, hopefully everybody's close to this point or you've at least copied mine. You aren't going to add these numbers. These are not the numbers you add. The numbers you have to add to get the variance are you have to take these numbers and multiply them by the respective probabilities. So I'm now going to put a column here for P of X, and I'm just going to copy those probabilities they gave me. That's this row up here. So the probability that there were zero defects was 0.265. For one, it was 0.291. For two defects, it was 0.242. And you might want to actually, uh, you know, draw a chart with lines. So if you want to get a use a straight edge, you can. If you were, I'm going to show you what work I would want to see. If I asked you to show the work for this, it's going to be hard to show all of this work. Then the probability of 3, 0.155. The probability of 4 is 0 0.046. Oh, no, 0 0.036. Let's use the right numbers. And the probability that there are five defects is 0 0.011. Let me make sure I copied all those probabilities right. Okay. Then what the formula is telling you to do is to multiply this number, the x minus mu squared, times the probability for each number. So I'm going to do this times this. Okay, so for all of these, I'm going to take this purple number and multiply by that number in black. That's going to give me six products. Those six products, those are the things I'm going to add. So what I'm doing here for the six products is now I'm doing the x minus 1.4 squared times p of x. That's what I'm doing in this last column. And this one I'm not going to be able to edit so much. And here's a mistake I see lots of people making. I know that's a long decimal number. But guys, you can't round yet. You can't round anything. Don't round the probabilities. Don't round these. Don't round anything until you're done. So it takes maybe an extra second or two to write down all four numbers if there are that many, but you need to write them all down. 
because this is not our final answer. 0.291. This one's 0 0.04656. That has a lot of numbers. Then I have 0.36 times 0.291. Nope, I did the wrong number. It's 0.36 times 0.2. Four, two. Let's get the right numbers there. Two point five six times point one five five. And this is really where the mistakes happen. It's not because it's usually not because someone's doing something wrong. It's doing something like what I just did, where you multiply by the, the wrong probability or you don't copy the probability down correctly. So you need to be really careful when you copy down that probability distribution. And you'll notice I'm not rounding anything. then these numbers are the numbers I need to add to get the variance. Okay? So when I add all of these, so I'm finding the variance, which is called sigma squared. I took each data value, subtracted the mean, and squared it multiplied those by their respective probabilities and now I need to find the sum of those so I'm going to add all of those together and that's going to be the variance so this is the longest thing it would be really difficult if you had a lot of data values And when I added all those, I got 1.4358. Now let's suppose you had to show this work on in the workspace in my map in my stat lab. Then what I would like to see, guys, is I would like to see these numbers right here. If you want to show one line of this, but you don't have to write this whole thing down. That's too much to fit in the show workspace. But you could show me, okay, when x is 0, I got 0 minus 1.4 squared, and then I multiplied that by its probability, and I got this first number. And then these are the numbers I got. And you could just write these numbers down here for the show work. Now, on this one, it tells me to round this to one decimal place. So I'm going to round that to 1.4. Ironically, that's the same as the mean, but that's just coincidence. So I got 1.4 for my variance as well as my mean on this. Let's see if my answer is right. It is. Then the last thing they want is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is easy. This is the hardest thing. So the mean you have to be super careful on. It's not hard, but you have to be super careful because if that's wrong, all of this is wrong. So this would this is a lot of work just to get it wrong because you calculated the mean incorrectly. Now, when I do the standard deviation, which is sigma, which we get by taking the square root of sigma squared, but we want to make sure when we do that 
that we don't take the square root of the rounded variance, take the square root of the unrounded variance right here. Sometimes you will get the same answer, whether you take the square root of the rounded or the unrounded, once you round the final answer, but sometimes you won't. So it is important, sometimes you'll be off by a little bit and you'll think, how do I get the variance wrong and get the standard deviation wrong? I mean, get the variance right and get the standard deviation wrong. Probably if you take, it was because you took the square root of the rounded variance. Which, like I said, sometimes, now, if you showed me your work and you took the square root of 1.4 instead of this, I'm going to give you most of the credit, but I may st still take off a little bit because I have specifically told you not to take the square root of the rounded variance, take the square root of the unrounded variance, just as we did in unit one. So I'm going to take the square root of this. I'm just going to leave that number. And I'm going to show you how I'm doing this in case some of you haven't done this in your calculator. So here's my number, my unrounded variance still in my calculator. And I'm going to take the square root of that number that's there. So I'm going to do second x squared, which gives me, or whatever, wherever your square root button is. So the square root, and then almost all calculators have a little a and s second function. Mine's on my negative button. So if I do second, and then push that. Notice it says ANS. That means it's going to take the square root of that last answer. You can close the parentheses or not. I don't think it will care. And then when I hit enter, oh, somehow I got a negative there. Let me delete that. Yeah, I accidentally hit the negative button. So I did the square root of my last answer. It didn't like the square root of a negative. And I get this which is 1.198, and they want me to round that to one decimal place, which would be about 1.2. And notice I'm boxing my final answers. You should do that in your work. And make sure you show me this. Also, if this is all on the same question, and let's say your variance is wrong, say you got the wrong answer for the variance, but you did your standard deviation, you need to take the square root of that, and you showed your work and took the square root of the unrounded variance, then I'm going to give you full credit for finding the standard deviation. If you found it correctly and rounded it correctly, I'm going to give you full credit. So uh, always show your work when I ask you to. On the ones that say show work on the test, make sure you do that because that's the only way to get credit. And I was just curious if I had taken square root of yeah, if we had just taken the square root of 1.4, we would still have gotten that. But sometimes it does make a little bit of a difference. It, it Sometimes it gives you the wrong number in the tenths place if you use the rounded number instead of the unrounded number. So try to always take the square root of the unrounded variance. I'm going to give you a minute to look at that. Cecil, does that help? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. Hopefully, seeing a way to organize your work in a chart like this, I'm hoping that that will make it seem a little less daunting and a little less, you know, mixed up and uh, messy. So, um, you might, when you watch the recording of this, you might either take a picture of how I set it up. Or if, you, if you've been doing your own right now, then hopefully you uh, wrote this down if you like the way I did this. And then I'm going to separate this here. That's my work for the standard deviation. Here's my mean in black. My variance I did here in blue. And the standard deviation here in purple. OK, 
Okay, the next the, the next thing I'd like to do, um, while you're working on that, I'm going to let you work on this one a little bit more and look over it. Um, while you're doing that, I'm going to check roll. And then we're going to go over the learning catalytics quiz that was due today on 3-1 through 3-3. So today is the 12th. Tomorrow's the first day of early voting. Don't forget to vote. When I call your name, raise your hand. Cecil, I know you're there. Go ahead and raise your hand, though. Um, let's see. Kayla Hernandez? Kendra? Christina? Layla? Mia? Okay, Layla, I see that. Mia's there. Diamond. Natalie. Samira. Temperance. Okay, any questions on this before we go to um, the learning catalytics quiz? Okay. So if you want to pull up your learning catalytics quiz and review it, then the way you would do that, I'm sorry, I'm looking for my my pen but it's under there. Yeah. The way you would review your answers, and this is for anything, is go to my math lab, my stat lab, and click on grade book. But if you want to, you can just look over what I'm doing. I'm going to try, this is going to take me a minute because I'm going to have to pull it up and then share my screen. So give me a minute on this. Miss Haley, I didn't get a chance to do the learning catalytics quiz because uh, for some reason that uh, during the last class you said that today we will do it together. No, that was the other one. There's two of them. We are going to do the review for the test one today in class. There were two different learning catalytics quizzes. So one of them was due today and the other one is the one we're going to do together. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry. the one that's due today. I'm sorry, what? What time was the one that's due today? It was due at 10. Oh. It was due at 10, but right before class. Um, and I will be dropping three quizzes, and now I'm going to go over it. So, but um, if you come to the class after the break, we're going to be doing another learning catalytics quiz that's intended to review for the test. And we will be doing that one together. I'm sorry that 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 um, that I'm, I didn't make that as clear as I should have. Okay, which is partly why I drop three quizzes at the end. It's just in case stuff like that happens. I will look back over the recording, though, from last week and make sure. And if I did say that we would be doing this one together, then I will, uh, I will figure out some way to make up for that.
Okay, now I'm going to try to share my screen with you for that learning catalytics quiz so we can go over that one. So let's see. Let's see, hopefully it's this one. Okay, so this was question one. This is the learning catalytics quiz that was due earlier today. And yes, we are going to do the other one together. So it's, it's a different one, although there are some similar questions on it. Okay, so this first question, what you'll see here, you can see what the responses were. 75% uh, correct. You, that It doesn't tell, um, let's see, let's... Let's move that. I don't want it to show everybody's like that. Let me see if I can. Hmm. I may have to just go over the questions and not share it with you. I probably will, but let's look at this first one. I pulled this one up says the set of all possible outcomes of a probability experiment and the answer is called that is called the sample space so that was the correct answer to that so um, I want to see if I can do something different on that hold on a second I'm seeing if it will. Hmm. I'm looking for a way for, for it to let you look at this without showing what everybody's answers were. Hmm. That didn't really work. We can see, um, click under the room, see what you see, meaning if we got it right or wrong. You can see your answers, your own answers. I'll just go through the questions then. I'm going to try to just go through the questions with you, okay, and not share the results on the screen. So I will talk about what the questions were. And then if you guys can just listen and um, look at your own answers so you can see what you put. So let me make sure I'm not sharing. I want to make sure it's not sharing this. Yeah, okay. So, um, the first question, like I said, was the set of all possible outcomes of a probability experiment, and the correct answer was sample space on that. So, on any of these that you missed, or if you haven't taken this, you might want to write these things down. Um, we will, some of these will show up on the review quiz that we do after the break. The second question said, which of the following numbers could be the probability of an event? And uh, on this one, you're looking for a number that's between 0 and 1. And only one of the answers is between 0 and 1. And that's 0 0.01 is between 0 and 1. So the other answers that are no good that cannot be probabilities are 1.4. That's because it's bigger than 1. 
One of the answers was negative 0 0.4. That can't be a probability because it's negative. And then um, another answer was 5.75, and that's way too big as well. So probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. The next question said, in a probability model, the sum of the probabilities of all outcomes must equal 1. And that's true. They have to, they have to add up to 1 or 100%. And everybody got that right. Yay. Number four, it says, given the sam a certain sample space, I think I'll pull this up. Um, actually, I can put some of these on the board and just go back and forth with you guys. So I need to erase this. So on, we're on question number four, and it says we're given this sample space, and it looks like it's the numbers 110. And this question says, find the probability of event E. And E is going to be the outcomes 1, 2, or 3. So this is that particular question. This is question 4. Event E is, and there's there will be a question kind of like this on the test probably. It says E is the is the outcome getting on two or three. Think of it like you can think of it like um, you're rolling a ten-sided die, and these are the possible outcomes or the numbers one through ten. And it wants this is like what's the probability of rolling a one, two, or three? So if I'm doing the probability of this event occurring, I first look to see how many ways it can happen? Well, there are three possible outcomes, so it can happen three ways because there are three possible outcomes. And on the bottom number, you put the total number of possible outcomes in the sample space, which is 10. So the answer on that one should have been 3 out of 10 or 3 tenths. Then number five was the same sample space, and on number five, let me, I'm writing down the question, it asks to find the probability of event F, where F is an even number, an even number less than nine. Okay, so, it's asking us to find this. So the probability of F occurring is going to be, well, first of all, the bottom number is going to be 10 because that's how many outcomes are in the sample space. And the top number is going to be however many ways F can happen. So basically, we're going to count how many outcomes are even and less than 9. Okay? So we want the even numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, but not 10. So 2, 4, 6, and 8 are the even numbers less than 9. How many outcomes is that? So it could have said, which is the same as 2, 4, 6, and 8. That would have been another way they could have defined event F. Those are the even numbers that are less than 9. There are 1, 2, 3, 4 of those numbers. So 4 out of 10 are in event F, and then we would reduce that by dividing the top and bottom by 2, and that would give us 2 fifths.
So that was the answer you should have gotten for that one. Then question number six says two events that have no outcomes in common are called blank events. When they have no outcomes in common, they are called mutually exclusive events. That was a definition that we talked about. Mutually exclusive events are events that do not have any outcomes in common. Okay, so and then so I'm going on to number seven. And on this one, we have a similar but different sample space. It looks like it's the numbers 1 through 12 instead of 1 through 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Right. So 10, 11, 12. So we have these 12 numbers in our sample space. I don't want those to look circled, so I'm going to rewrite those. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There. And the question, it, it tells you what E and G and H are. So E is the outcomes from 2 to 7. If you're watching the recording and it looks weird, or even those of you watching now, it's because I've, I've pulled up another screen and I'm looking at the question. The G is the uh, outcomes 9, it looks like 9 through 12, 9, 10, 11, 12. And H has outcomes 2, 3, and 4. And this particular question says, are E and G mutually exclusive? Mutually exclusive, remember, means no outcomes in common. So we're looking to see if E and G have any outcomes in common. And they do not. See, E is 2 through 7 and G is 9 through 12. They have no outcomes in common, so they are mutually exclusive. And then I'm going to go to problem question 8 because it has the same setup. And this one says, find the probability of, I think it says G prime. Yeah, G prime. So to find the probability of G prime, remember that means a complement. And the way you find the probability of a complement is to do 1 minus the probability of the event itself. So that would give us 1 minus, and now we need to find the probability of G. Our bottom number this time is 12. Now we look at G, see how many ways G can happen. 1, 2, 3, 4 ways, 4 out of 12. Now you can either get a common denominator now, or you can reduce this first. I'm going to reduce that first, 4 over 12, if I divide by 4, would be 1 out of 3. And then getting a common denominator, I'm going to rename 1, 3 over 3, so that I'll have the same denominator. And then I keep the common denominator and subtract, and that gives me 2 thirds for the probability of G complement. And then going on to question nine, it has these same um, events up there. But question nine asks us to find the probability of, I'm going to erase this. So question nine says find the probability of E or G. The probability of E or G. So let's apply first. And if I ask you to show the work on one like this, then what I'm wanting you to do is look up the formula for it and apply the formula. So I'm not going to put any numbers in yet. I'm just going to apply my OR formula. The OR formula says take the probability of the first thing plus the probability of the second thing, 
and subtract. So or always has a plus and a minus in it. So you add the two probabilities and you subtract off the probability that they happen at the same time. In other words, if they have any outcomes in common, if they are not mutually exclusive, you have to subtract off those outcomes that you have counted twice. So the probability of E, E has one, two, three, four, five out of 12 outcomes plus the probability of G, G has one, two, three, four out of 12 outcomes minus the probability of E and G. Well, we already said E and G were mutually exclusive, so we don't have any outcomes in common. No outcomes in common. And it does not hurt to put the minus zero there. It's not going to change your answer. And the reason why they had no outcomes in common, well, you can look at them and see that there's no outcomes in common. But let's suppose that um, G had a seven in it as well. Then that one outcome in common would be one over 12 right here. But they don't have anything in common, so we have zero. Maybe we should put zero out of 12. They have zero out of 12 outcomes in common. And now out of 12, we have five plus four is nine, or five plus four minus zero is still nine. Dividing by three gives us three fourths is the probability of E or G. Now, if you were in my stat lab and they asked you to change that to a decimal, you just divide it out, three divided by four, and you'd get 0.75. You need to make sure you give your answer in the form that it wants it. There's only one more question, so I know we're a little bit past time before the break. But um, let me make sure. Did anybody have a question? Let's see. Cecil and Temperance, it looks like your hands are up. Do you have a question? Yes. So I'm looking at, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm looking at my LCQ, whatever, number nine, and I selected D, which is three fourths, and it marked it wrong. Okay, I'll look at that. Thank you. Will you send me an email so I can look at yours in particular? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Did anybody else get it counted wrong when you picked the right answer? Let me let me look at that real quick and make sure I put the right answer on there. Probably of E or G. Yeah, that should have been the right answer. Let me see. Let me make sure I copied everything right. So S is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <coughs> 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. G is 9, 10, 11, 12. They have nothing in common. So E is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, that should have been 6. That's why temperance, that's 6. <clears throat> Darn it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, that's an easy mistake to make, right? So, okay, so this is a good lesson, though. I'm glad this happened because let's say you did this. If this was one where I allowed you to show work, let's hope so, because if you showed your work and I saw that you put 5 over 12 instead of 6 out of 12, but you did, but you did this, and you did this, you just had that one number wrong, I'm not going to take off very much at all. All right? Do y'all see? I'm hoping you see the, the reason and the, um, the help that it is to show as much work as possible. That lets me give you credit for what you've done right. So, yeah, that's 10 out of 12, which reduces to 5 out of 6. No one else is going to say anything because the people that got it right didn't want to get it wrong. I know what's going on. Okay. Okay, then this last question. <clears throat> says, 
the probability that the person that a person in the United States has type A positive blood is 31 percent. So I'm going to write the probability of A positive blood is 0.31 A positive. That's not written like that. It's written like this. Okay. Then it says if three people are selected at random, find the probability all three are type A positive. So we pick three people. We want the probability all three are A positive. That means another way to say all three are A positive is the first one is A positive, so I'm going to write A positive on number one, the first person. And the second one is A positive. Put a little two there for the second person. And the third person is A positive. This is the only way all three can be A positive. If the first one and the second one and the third one. So we're going to apply our AND rule that says that we multiply the probabilities and keeping in mind that people are all independent so you don't have to worry about the condition remember normally this is what your the probability of A and B normally looks like this probability of A times the probability of B given that A happened that's your normal formula but this condition here only has an effect when you have dependent events. People are independent events, always. Just because one person is A positive doesn't have any effect on whether the next two people are. So the condition doesn't matter with people. And so I can just do the probability the first one is A positive times the probability the second one is A positive times the probability the third one is A positive. And basically it's just taking that probability, because that's the probability any random, randomly selected person is A positive, and you're going to multiply it three times. So another way you can look at it is we're taking 0.31 and raising it to the third power. is 0 0.029791 and then let me look at that and see if there were rounding instructions there weren't but it was multiple choice so um, the correct answer was that was there was 0 0.03 So none of the other answers are equivalent to this. So the correct answer of the choices was 0 0.03. Um, and then suppose, let's just talk about this for a second. And I know I'm a little bit over. But um, if they said, what's the probability that none are A positive of those three? Well, the probability that a person is not A positive, one person, that's the complement of being A positive. So that would be 1 minus 0 0.31, which is 0 0.69. OK? So if you wanted to know the probability that none of them were A positive, that means the first one's not, and the second one's not, and the third one is not, then you would multiply 0 0.69 three times. That would give you the probability that none of them are A positive. And then you could do an at least one probability by subtracting that from one. And I know that's a lot to talk about right there. We can talk about that again after the break if you have a question. Or you might want to look through those at least one probabilities. This would have been, I think, in section um, 3.3, I think. So if you want to look over those, and see if you have any questions, because I'll answer questions on everything um, after the break. 
So after the break, guys, this is what we're going to do. Um, we are going to do the learning catalytics review for the test together, or try to do as much as we can together. And I'll talk specifically about the test, like how many questions are on it and when it's going to be available and when it's going to be due. We'll talk about that. Um, and if you have other questions, I'll go over those as well. Temperance. Did you have a question? No, I'm sorry. That's okay. So let's break. It won't be as long a break as we usually have, but I want to make sure you guys are prepared for the test, so that's okay. Um, it's 1140, and we will come back after the break at 12. I'm going to leave this up here. Um, if you'd like, I wish I hadn't taken up so much room with this. Um, I'd like to show you how you would do. I'm going to put a couple of more questions. I'm going to do the probability none are A positive of the three, and I'll just put it over here, okay, so that you can look at it during the break. So you can go ahead and go on your break. I'm just going to put um, extra questions up here. This was the probability here that all were A positive. That's what this was. So we're still picking three people. Sorry about the mess. <laughs> 